Good evening, everyone, and, and welcome to the New School and to our event, uh, Pardons, uh, the power nobody wants. Uh, the first time I'm going to do is ask you all to rub your hands together, you know, real lot to get it warmed up in here. We're going to try to get it, uh, we're going to try to get it warm, but um, I, I know it's a little chilly still, but bear with us. Um, well, we are here to hear uh, uh, um, uh, a keynote address, and then we're going to follow that with a panel discussion on the uh, pardon power, discussing the ethical and other issues involved in that. I'd like to start by welcoming our keynote speaker, the Honorable Dennis Jacobs, Chief Judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. And then we have a group of fine panelists. Um, our moderator, of course, is our own, Senator Bob Carey, President Emeritus uh, here at the New School. Uh, and then we have the Honorable Robert uh, L. Ehrlich, Senior Counsel at King and & Spaulding, and former Governor of Maryland, as well as a former Congressman from that state. Next is Julie Stewart, who's the President and Founder of Families Against Mandatory Minimums. Um, and last but not least is Margaret Colgate Love, an attorney and a former pardon attorney at the Office of Pardon Attorney for the U.S. Department of Justice. Well, the pardon power has had a long and controversial history. And it's always an emotionally charged uh, topic, especially in light of the recent uh, Troy Davis matter. Davis was convicted of the 1989 murder of a Georgia policeman. He maintained his innocence on grounds of testimony evidence. Amnesty International, the NAACP, former President Jimmy Carter, Pope Benedict uh, XVI, uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and others called for a new trial or evidentiary hearing. Hundreds of thousands urged the Georgia State Board of Pardons and Paroles to grant clemency, but all appeals failed and Davis was executed last month. In, 19, uh, excuse me, in 2003, uh, while I was dean of a Northwestern School of Law, uh, then Illinois Governor George Ryan, in a speech uh, at the law school, um, commuted all Illinois death sentences to prison terms of life or less, history's most sweeping emptying of death row. He cited a range of different issues, including fairness and, and, and others in the application of the death penalty and his own uncertainty about whether he could be confident that the people, uh, people sentenced to death actually were, were guilty. In part, that came from the work of a variety of organizations, including the Center on Wrongful Convictions at Northwestern University, uh, that have focused on the fact that many people on death row or even not on death row in other parts of the prison system are factually, are factually innocent. Well, pardons and clemency trigger passionate beliefs surrounding the death penalty and victims' rights, notions of justice, uh, morality, racial inequality, and even economics. And it really makes this uh, evening's event especially timely. The topic is also of great interest right here in our own neighborhood, where just across the street, the Innocence Project, which is affiliated with the Benjamin uh, Cardoza School of Law at Yeshiva University, uh, has been engaged in national litigation and public policy uh, efforts dedicated to exonerating wrongfully convicted indiv individuals and preventing future injustice. And Bob Carey's uh, Clemency Commission takes a slightly different approach. Uh, they promote the appropriate use of clemency where those imprisoned do not claim that they're innocent and either have received unjust or overly harsh sentences relative to the crime committed or have been model prisoners who have demonstrated and reached the goal of rehabilitation. Well, we're going to start off uh, with Judge Jacobs, who will address us in the history of the pardon power and its role in correcting injustice in the application of criminal law, followed then by a panel discussion led by, uh, led by Bob Carey. Uh, finally, one other thing before you get up, Judge, uh, that I want to mention is uh, to all of us that the program is being photographed and videotaped. So, Judge? No one could do what I do for long without becoming preoccupied with the problem of error in the administration of the law, either by conviction of the wrong party or by uh, conviction by improper or unconstitutional means or by imposition or mandate of a grossly disproportionate sentence. All of us as judges are troubled by the enormous consequences of error generally, but it's particularly uh, an anxiety in criminal cases. To deal with this problem, some of us turn to proceduralism, calculating that layer upon layer of procedural safeguard will root out error, absolutely. But it never does, and criminal cases never seem to be finally resolved 
and finality is an important judicial virtue. The odd thing is that a mechanism exists for alleviating the occasional injustices that any system of law, however well administered and well staffed, cannot make right. And that is the power of pardon. And the theme of my observations this afternoon is that the pardon power is a wonderful, integral, nifty device for the sound administration of law, but that lately its influence has been unrealized and neglected. Pardon power is, of course, an executive prerogative, and so it's not my department, really. But I have some observations about it that I would like to put forward for thought and for discussion. Few powers go begging. And one might think that the pardon power in particular would be valued, sought, and exercised, and that he would even be a temptation. The pardon power is an awesome and sublime thing. Congress has a power of general amnesty, but the president's power is a thing apart. It's an executive power that is essentially unchecked by separation of powers. Congress cannot inhibit it, and the judiciary cannot review it. It's not impaired in its effectiveness, even if it's arbitrary and capricious, as it sometimes, in fact, is. It's a power to save and serve one's friends and allies, and it can do good, unalloyed, if that's what you're into. The decision to exercise it is localized in a single mind and person, and there's no required form. During the Civil War, President Lincoln sent a mounted messenger from the District of Columbia with a handwritten message. Colonel Mulligan, if you haven't shot Barney D yet, don't. <laughs> the arbitrary and singular character of this power is a part of its mystique. It's a kingly attribute. As Benjamin Whichcote observed, in all supremacy of power, there is inherent a prerogative to pardon. More arresting, it's a kingly power because it is a godly prerogative exercised on earth. Hence the deathbed jest of Heinrich Heine, who said, well, of course God will pardon me. It's his job. I think that as citizens of a republic, we feel uncomfortable with it for the very reason that it seems so close to a kingly power or a prerogative of the Lord. But the founders had good reason for entrusting this power to one individual, notwithstanding the preference of some at the time for the involvement of the Senate. The issue is nicely presented by Alexander Hamilton in Federalist Paper 74, published in March of 1788. He thought that a single person would be more just and that a group such as the Senate where the ultimate responsibility would be shared among a lot of people, might be more stubborn and less scrupulous. Putting aside his argument concerning treason, which is technical, Hamilton's thinking is as follows, edited and a bit paraphrased by me. He wrote, humanity and good policy conspire to dictate that the benign prerogative of pardoning should be as little as possible fettered or embarrassed. The criminal code of every country partakes of so much necessary severity that without an easy access to exceptions in favor of unfortunate guilt, justice would wear a countenance too sanguinary and cruel. The sense of responsibility is always strongest in proportion as it is undivided. The reflection that the fate of a fellow creature depended on his sole fiat would naturally inspire scrupulousness and caution. The dread of being accused of weakness or connivance would beget equal circumspection, though of a different kind. Ha Hamilton continued, on the other hand, as men generally derive confidence from their numbers, as in the Senate, they might often encourage each other in an act of obduracy to deny clemency, and might be less sensitive to just criticism for an injudicious clemency to an injured for an injudicious clemency on these accounts one man appears to be a more eligible dispenser of the mercy of government than a body of men now as a judge i'm intrigued by the practical advantage of having such a power available to correct errors in the criminal justice system chief justice rehnquist acknowledging the unalterable fact that our system of justice is fallible, observed that executive clemency has provided the fail-safe in our criminal justice system. 
but it is not serving that function today. An odd thing is that our presidents have been heaped with prerogatives that would be almost royal if there were any royals left with that magnitude of power, yet the one power that presidents have alone and exercise as kings is foregone and seemingly not missed. The federal pardon power is conferred upon the president and state constitutions confer that power on all but two governors. In the United States Constitution, the pardon power is expressed in a few pithy words. The president shall have power to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States, except in cases of impeachment. The exercise of this power is described by indeterminate and overlapping words like clemency, amnesty, remission, usually used for fines, indemnity from prosecution, and so on. It has been used, notably, to heal wounds of war and to reconcile deep political splits. It is an instrument that can be wielded imaginatively and strategically. For example, on the state side, the Georgia Board of Pardons and Parole, in which the pardoning power of that state has been lodged since 1943, pardoned 138 immigrants convicted of misdemeanors who otherwise faced deportation by virtue of the 1996 immigration reform. Governor Patterson of New York pardoned 24 people for the same reason. From my perspective, the great promise of the pardon power is its use when the court system misfires. When general, general rules work injustices in individual cases, and when application of well-intended laws have unforeseen results or embarrass the judicial system. Pardon is, sometime, pardon is sometimes called into use to soften the edges of the law, for example, in mercy killings or crimes of passion and so on. And the system of sentencing has unavoidable problems that pardons can alleviate. Mainly, these are problems of perspective. Congress expects and acts mandatory minimums having in mind the general run of offenses and the people who would commit, but, but commit those offenses, but Congress cannot reasonably anticipate the exceptional case or all the persons who will be in the dragnet. Judges also have a problem of perspective. They have discretion in most cases, but sentencing decisions entail predictions about the future, sometimes 20 years into the future. As Yogi Berra said, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. And aggressive antisocial tendencies may mellow with age. Antisocial types, just like the rest of us, tend to run out of steam. So the pardon power is a needed corrective for these failures of perspective. In some respects, the pardon power resembles the choices made by others in the justice system prosecutors exercising discretion, police turning a blind eye, nullifying jurors behaving badly. But the awesome nature of the pardon power is that it can overrule and transcend on the side of clemency all other decisions and influences in the justice system, yet the single most arresting fact about the pardon power today is the decline in its use and prestige. The history of this power gives some idea of its force and its possibilities when used imaginatively. Uh, don't worry, I won't go back to the code of Hammurabi, <coughs> though one could. George Washington used it to pardon participants in the Whiskey Rebellion. Thomas Jefferson used it to pardon those prosecuted under the Alien and Sedition Acts. Presidents Harrison and Cleveland pardoned Mormon bigamists. President Coolidge pardoned World War I deserters. President Kennedy pardoned many of those sentenced under the mandatory minimum penalties of the 1956 Narcotics Act. And President Ford pardoned Vietnam era draft resistors by creating a board to make recommendations case by case. Looking back in, in the second in half of the 19th century, presidents granted half the applications made for pardons. True, at the time, federal offenses were, few, were different in character, less threatening of the peace, and very few. And federal prisoners were confined in Dickensian state prisons. Also, 
pardons then served more of a review function because the right to appeal federal convictions was first created by statute in 1907. Over time, the pardon power was supplemented and it was actually replaced, rendered less necessary by mitigations that were being built into the justice system, such as indeterminate sentencing, parole, and good time. Play was built into the joints. But in recent decades, as these kinds of mitigations have been rolled back by mandatory minimum sentences and by the sentencing guidelines, one would have thought that the utility and appeal of the pardon power would have regenerated. That has not happened. Lately, what Hamilton called the benign prerogative has fallen on bad times. Declining numbers of pardons were issued by successive administrations in the 1980s and 1990s. And many of those that were issued have been trivial or tactical or misguided. President Reagan pardoned the owner of the Yankees for making illegal campaign contributions to President Nixon's 1972 reelection. He pardoned Junior Johnson, a stock car racer, for moonshining with his father in 1956. And he pardoned a minor player in the Watergate break-in. Among the pardons issued by President George H.W. Bush were a man convicted of stealing 12 six-packs of beer as a teenager, <clears throat> a former mailman convicted of stealing $3.65 from the Post, and a man convicted of moonshining in 1947. In eight years, George W. Bush received over 11,000 petitions for pardon or commutation, and he granted 200. But even if 2% seems appreciable, consider that in many instances the sentences had been served long before and most of the offenses were trivial. One pardon recipient had used pesticides to kill the coyotes that were preying on the wild turkeys. He got the coyotes, and he saved the turkeys. But he was convicted of a felony when two bald eagles were poisoned by feasting on the coyotes. Another pardon granted by George W. Bush was granted to a man convicted of stealing $10.40 in the post. Yet another was granted to uh, another moonshiner, and still another to a man convicted of turning back the odometer on a used car. President Obama has done no more. Out of four to 5,000 petitions, he has so far granted 17. Most of those were for minor offenses that entailed no penalty greater than probation. In all, or almost all instances, the sentence, such as it was, had already been served. True, one was for an offense that drew a sentence of two years following a court martial, but that was the longest sentence among them. Another was a sentence of probation for a liquor law violation a half century earlier. Another, also probation, was for mutilating coins in 1963. Yet another was to a fellow who had served 100 days in jail followed by probation and community service for aiding and abetting the possession and sale of alligator hides. The chance of winning a pardon is nearing the odds of winning the lottery which, as someone said, is the same whether you buy a ticket or not. President Clinton exercised the pardon power twice as many times as George W. Bush, but the, the manner of his exercise and the sometimes astonishing or unaccountable objects of his clemency drew a lot of criticism. Prosecutors and victims came forward. His pardons of domestic terrorists and a fugitive plutocrat and others may have actually inhibited the exercise of the pardon power by his successors. As happened with President Clinton, pardons can backfire, and the executive may be exposed to criticism. It happens. At Thanksgiving 2002, President George W. Bush pardoned a turkey by the name of Katie. Now, these turkey pardons have been given on that occasion since the Eisenhower administration. But controversy erupted when an animal rights activist group visited the Virginia farm at which pardoned turkeys live out their days and reported that Katie, the first and only female turkey ever to be honored with a pardon, was without a roost and living in unheated quarters. Concern over unjust criticism is no doubt one reason for the relative disuse of the pardon power. Another 
is surely the limited upside for the executive. And yet another is that the executive is not well positioned to identify the person who gets chewed up by the system and is a worthy candidate for relief. Voices from prisons are rarely amplified by lawyers, let alone lawyers who are sufficiently well connected. So I would think there should be a role for judges who are in a very good position to identify misfires in the legal system, instances in which the law, properly applied, is counterproductive or miscalculated, or in a general term, unjust. Yet judges hesitate to commend candidates for pardon or commutation to the executive. Judges might do so in a sentencing transcript or in opinions denying habeas corpus and other post-conviction remedies. With such a recommendation, a defendant could seek a pardon or a commutation without the services of a lawyer or a clinic. The problem is that the codes of conduct governing at least federal judges tend to inhibit an active role. The relevant committee of the United States Judicial Conference tells us, me, that it is normally inadvisable for a judge to make a personal recommendation at the request of someone applying for a pardon. The committee sensibly advises that an appearance of impropriety may arise when a judge exercises influence on the Justice Department, which is, after all, a frequent litigant in our courts. As far as I can see, there's no explicit bar on a judicial recommendation if it's not prompted by a request, for example, an observation and an opinion that neutral application of the law is working in injustice that might wisely be cured by a pardon or commutation. But judges are cautioned to avoid involving themselves in matters that, like parole and clemency, are inherently connected with the executive function of prosecution and incarceration. So federal judges naturally steer clear of things that are so clearly outside our turf. To a degree, I think that is unfortunate, especially since there are occasions when judges weigh in on matters confided to other branches. Thus, now and then, judges issue opinions that advise Congress when a statute seems to be defective and in need of clarification, and judges do make recommendations to the Bureau of Prisons in the executive branch. There's no reason why the pardon power cannot in our day be exercised with the same scope and ambition with which it has been wielded in the past. I publicly suggested back in 2003 that the pardon power, more particularly the power to commute sentences, be used to repair the sentencing disparity that had opened between drug offenses involving crack and those involving powder cocaine. It's an observed fact that this sentencing disparity worked to the radical disadvantage of African American defendants and became something of an embarrassment to the judicial system. Professors Shanor and Miller at Emory proposed the use of the pardon power to, cur to curtail such sentences using an appointed board to describe the subclasses of persons who should be candidates and consulting prison wardens to identify likely inmates. The problem was resolved in other ways. Legislation, fairly recent, rules adopted by the United States Sentencing Guidelines Commission, court opinions deciding whether and to what extent these new reforms should be retroactive. And, and that solved the problem in part, at least for the courts. But the fix that we have is cumbersome, and it took at least a decade to conceive and implement. And it has done little to alleviate the problem for prison inmates who served long mandatory minimums on that score. And it has done nothing at all to deal with people jailed on long mandatory minimum sentences imposed under other statutes. In a nutshell, the pardon power is a majestic instrument to correct unavoidable oversights, misjudgments, and limitations of perspective. What a shame that it should lie neglected or be put to trivial uses when it is the easiest way to improve law and justice decisively and at one stroke. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judge. Uh, I'm going to make some opening remarks, but we have uh, until about, I guess, 7 o'clock 
and then we'll do uh, is it seven o'clock. Yeah, seven o'clock. Uh, we'll try to take some questions from the from the audience, and uh, approximately seven twenty-five, we're going to wrap this thing up. So, uh, my my remarks, I say the panel will be an attempt to give you some kind of an idea, and I'll just go down the line to let each of you uh, uh, say a few things at the at the outset. But my opening remarks will be an attempt to give you some kind of an idea of of, of what each of these panelists bring uh, to this conversation. Uh, first, uh, my, my first contact uh, with this, came, this issue came during the four years I was governor of Nebraska. Uh, under the Constitution of Nebraska, there's a pardon board. Governors uh, chair that pardon board. So I can very much aware of the difficulty of these decisions. Uh, and they, they are quite difficult and quite emotional. Uh, and the most serious ones almost always have very emotional people on both sides. Um, uh, and uh, uh, when a decision is made by a governor, uh, it almost always provokes uh, some kind of response. And so uh, during the 10 years I served as president of the New School, uh, from time to time, uh, uh, a man by the name of Jason Flom would call up and say, you know, you've uh, experienced this and um, I've, I've got a case and would you try to help me with it? And uh, so I, on occasion, would make uh, calls. And, well, these are all state cases, no federal cases uh, uh, that I was asked to, to, to help with. And in each one of those, what I, what I found, Governor, was, was every governor that I talked to, and there was, I don't know, eight or ten governors that we talked to, uh, would say, I'm, I'm worried about Willie Horton. Uh, it goes all the way back to 1988. I mean, uh, uh, some of you younger people will not remember that, but that was a very contentious pardon given by Michael Dukakis that was... Uh, uh, used in a, in a very effective television ad because Willie Horton had committed a crime after he got out. So uh, I'm, I'm very much aware of the need to provide some kind of political protection, which is why I asked Governor Ehrlich and, and Governor Kane and Governor Caperton to be a part of this Citizens Clemency Commission. Uh, I don't want you to think that the name implies that we've got a lot of staff and a lot of resources because at the moment we have none. Um, and we're mostly, <laughs> mostly uh, uh, I would say at the moment relying on Julie and others to, to, to uh, call upon us. And at the moment, I told her earlier, we haven't been called upon to do anything. But uh, it's, it's, there are real political risks. And I, I asked Governor Ehrlich uh, uh, because he was, a very, he was very brave on this issue and uh, was very uh, much willing to use the power that a governor has. Uh, 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 Margaret Love, on, on the other hand, uh, uh, spent time at the federal level. And, you know, among the interesting things, the, the chair of the uh, uh, governor uh, of, the, of the Georgia Pardon Board was, was uh, first said he could come and then had a scheduling conflict and was unable to come. And, and what's interesting about Georgia is, to me, is they've removed the politics. Uh, there's a pardon board and the governor's actually taken out of it. And of all the con uh, controversy uh, over this uh, death penalty case in Georgia, uh, there was never raised an accusation that the, uh, that a, the decision was made based on politics because there's no elected people on that board. And it is quite notable that the state of Georgia pardons, what, uh, several, several times more than, than, uh, than New York does with a much smaller population. It's not what you would expect. And among the things, Margaret, I thought perhaps you'd help us understand is how federal law is, uh, affects the, uh, our capacity. Uh, to do a pardon, because at the federal level, those times actually I have been from time to time asked on, uh, to assist on federal pardons, there you run into Mark Rich. Uh, you run into the, the case of Mark Rich, and it's almost reverse of what happens at the state level. At the, at, the, at the state level, the governor makes a decision and there's real consequences. At the federal level, you have to overrule staff to grant a pardon. Uh, and, governor, and President Clinton overruled staff in the case of, of uh, Mark Rich and um, uh, got, I would say, into a fair amount of trouble. And I actually would say that it, it, it is a deterrent today, that the memory of the, the Rich case and a few others that were granted uh, during that area. Now, maybe Margaret has a different view of, of that particular matter, but I'm struck by the, by the uh, Georgia process. And I, 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 I must say, I'm 12 years in the Senate, I never paid much attention to that process. And it may be that a statutory fix is possible to improve our capacity to, to see more pardons at the federal level, because I think there's unquestionably a case that that needs to occur. Uh, uh, Anthony uh, has, been, has been given clemency, and so he knows uh, what it feels like. You know, he understands the, the power in a very personal way, and uh, uh, I hope can help humanize this process a bit for us and, and understand uh, what it does and what, it's, uh, what, what the pardon power is capable of providing to individuals. Uh, uh, 
uh, Julie is uh, you know, experienced mandatory minimums with her brother. And one of the cases we were successful with, uh, I, I think Julie was involved with, I know it came, almost everything that Jason uh, calls me about has some connection to you. So uh, uh, this was a case in Kansas where a woman got a, was sentenced to life uh, for uh, selling an ounce of marijuana on a sting. Three strikes her out. It was the third attempt. She was a young mother with two children. She'd served 20 plus years in prison. Uh, the Kansas legislature had changed the law, uh, uh, removing the life sentence, mandatory life sentence, but didn't make it retroactive. So it didn't apply to her. And so the, the, the appeal had to be made to the governor, in this case, Governor Sibelius, who's now Secretary of HHS. He made uh, the decision to do it. But even in that particular case, i close with this. Uh, uh, Tom Kane told this story. I hope uh, I'm not getting him in trouble by retelling this. Um, one of the reasons that he uh, said yes to being on this commission is he understands that, that there are times when, when saying, look, the, the individual made the best call that they possibly could, and you just don't know. Uh, he had a case. Uh, of a young man who got a uh, 40-year uh, uh, sentence for a, an armed robbery. Uh, his mother was so afraid of him, she turned him in. Uh, and uh, at the 20-year mark, everybody favored uh, a pardon, everyone. Uh, the prosecutor, the jury, uh, the judge, uh, uh, everybody favored uh, uh, pardoning this individual. And what no one could know, no one could know this, that Inside of his head for 20 years, he was saying to himself, if I ever get out of this, I'm going to kill my mom, which he did on the second day of his release. So you can't know. You just, these clemency cases are exceptionally difficult because you never know. And there's a tendency, I'd say an unfortunate tendency, because as the judge said, there's almost no upside to granting clemency or pardon. There's almost no political upside to granting a, a clemency or pardon, and it's all, all potential downside. Uh, and we who are making judgments about this, I think, need to understand that. So, Governor Ehrlich, you, I very much appreciate. <laughs> well, I, you look, you, you. There's you, a lot to talk about here. I know. I mean, uh, you led on this, and you know well, what, what potential negative consequences. First of all, are. it's great to see you, and you've, you've assembled a great panel here. I have to say, and, and sitting next to these two is uh, is a treat, Judge. I don't even have to suck up to you. So, I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> Margaret, as all of you know, is a thought leader here. Uh, it has been for many years, and we finally meet today. So just a couple real brief thoughts, and, uh, and I'll turn it across to the panel. Uh, at a very fundamental level, I just viewed this power as a way to do justice, and the job description of governor of chief executive includes the ability to do justice. Uh, that would be my, my, certainly my, my predicate observation here. Um, why? Uh, Bob just talked about it. First, to correct sentence injustices, three-time loser, mandatory minimums. As a member of the Maryland State Legislature in the 80s, the Get Tough One crime movement had led legislatures, including ours, to uh, increase the predicate offenses to get increasingly violent juveniles waived up to, to adult court. Sometimes those, those juveniles belonged in adult court, sometimes they did not. In any event, uh, that movement resulted in some kids, otherwise not terribly prone to violence, getting into the adult system. And once they're in the adult system, Judge, they're gone. They're gone. Uh, second, obviously, just to correct acts of pure injustice, it's the exception, but. Uh, maybe not so rare as some in the audience might think. And, and, and third, just as a pragmatic, ma just as a pragmatic matter, uh, the 18-year-old uh, possession offense, the 18-year-old bar fight in Ocean City, Maryland, now 38 years old, trying to get security clearance work for NSA, can't do it. Can't do it. Just as a matter of full employment, in many cases, just to remove this, this artificial barrier that no longer makes sense, particularly given the, uh, the intervals between the time of the crime and the time of application. Uh, with regard to me, I'm a Republican, guilty, sorry, even in Maryland. Um, but it was a campaign promise I made as an attorney. Uh, I found it interesting that my predecessors, my Democratic predecessors, and in Maryland, they're always Democratic predecessors, uh, had, had uh, I guess, Vice President Agnew, the last Republican governor before me. So. Uh, in any event, my, uh, 
more certainly more liberal uh, predecessors and successors had had no interest in this issue. And I had a great interest in this issue. I was an attorney and trained attorney. And again, getting back to the my my definition of the job description of governor to do justice when appropriate. Um, I received relatively little negative feedback, and I'll, I'll get to I'll come back to that point in, in a brief second. Um, with regard to a very aggressive program that, that I ran, and I do believe the reason is this. Particularly given the, the drug sentencing federal guidelines, state guidelines, what occurred in state legislatures around the country in the 70s and 80s, it was no longer an issue confined to a particular venue. It wasn't an urban problem. It wasn't a suburban problem. It wasn't a black issue. It wasn't a white issue. It was a parent issue. So you could go in the suburbs and look at white audiences, more conservative, and say, you know what? Here's what's happening. And maybe in the past those parents wouldn't pay attention, but guess what? Because so many of those families have been touched by maybe their own kid getting caught up by a new awareness that these issues, the scourge of particularly drugs, crosses every line in our society, a lot of people paid attention. It wasn't the, the verb to, 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 to Willie Horton became a verb in American politics. And it's still there, quite frankly. And, and, and you've written about that a lot. I hope I didn't steal a line from you, but, but that's the fact of it. Uh, in any event, I found not necessarily a wild enthusiasm, but an acceptance across audiences, across philosophical partisan lines with regard to a very aggressive and progressive approach to this issue. And although there wasn't a whole lot of yelling in the stands, go Bob, go, there wasn't a whole lot of, oh, he's, he's, he's weak on crime either. And we just did what we thought was right. And that's what you have to do as governor. Uh, last, uh, Margaret's written about this. It's very gratifying as an executive. Uh, governors aren't thanked a whole lot. You don't deserve a medal for running for governor, but to the, in respect to what you're able to do to restore lives, to restore opportunities, to restore employment options, to restore the ability to take care of your family, restoration, comes back to you in many ways. And the letters, emails, um, personal testimonies received to me uh, was a very enjoyable part of the job and made some of the political risk uh, clearly worthwhile. Margaret. I wish there were more governors who um, had the attitude that Governor Ehrlich did when he was in office. Um, we were all cheering for him down in uh, D.C. Uh, but um, in any event, um, let me comment on a couple of things that um, have been said. Um, I think there has never been a time um, in our country's history where there has been more need for pardon. Um, and when there has been so little understanding of it among those who are elected to office, uh, the public very frequently doesn't understand it very well. Um, and so little sense of um, public responsibility. Um, and I think that's one um, uh, way in which Governor Ehrlich really does stand out, the, the notion that he considered it a part of his job, not some sort of perk of office um, that you get to, to do at the end of your term. Um, it never was exercised as a kind of irregular end-term perk of office in the federal system um, until the Clinton administration. Um, for all of our history, the president's pardoned very regularly, very frequently, very kind of low-key, um, occasional scandals, occasional controversial cases, um, never a scandal in which there was any whiff of sort of impropriety. There were people who would disagree with grants, um, and sometimes very strongly, but no, no sense of real kind of impropriety, unfair access, um, until the Clinton administration. 
Um, I, I, I think that a tremendous part of what went wrong in the federal system in the Clinton administration, it wasn't, didn't begin there, but it really came to a culmination there, was a kind of a breakdown of the system for administering the power. Um, there are many, many systems in this country. Um, I'm really interested, I had forgotten you were in Nebraska because uh, that's a very interesting system in Nebraska. There are six states in this country where the governor actually sits on a, um, a clemency board. Pardon. Uh, uh, yeah, pardon, but I mean, we always use the term clemency as a sort of a umbrella term, so. In so. Nebraska, we didn't. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, you did sentence commutations too, though, yes, right? We did. Yeah, right. So, in any event, um, in the federal system, um, the system for administering the power um, was through the Justice Department, through the Attorney General. Um, and in a way, what went wrong in the federal system, very badly wrong, was that the Justice Department sort of stopped doing its job. Um, there's a kind of a long story as to how it came to be that the Attorney General himself stopped being the source of recommendations to the President. Um, but what happened was that in this sort of uh, uh, war on crime atmosphere, um, the agenda of the prosecutors in the department essentially took over. Um, and so it wasn't possible um, it was very frustrating to me, actually, because um, uh, I, I would like to have recommended many more cases, but I simply couldn't get them out of my own agency. Um, so when the end of President and and to be sure, President Clinton wasn't exactly clamoring for them um, until the very end. And uh, I must say, I'm rather surprised that, that he didn't think about it earlier. He came from a state where pardoning is a part of um, a way of life in Arkansas, um, and it is a frequent and not always terribly successful, but, uh, but a very frequent regular uh, part of the governor's business in Arkansas. So, so um, I think what really went wrong was that in the federal system was that the system went wrong. And then the second thing, uh, we didn't have a president and we haven't had a president, and I'm on, sad to say we appear not to have a president now who has that same sense that exercising the pardon power is sort of a part of the job um, and has a kind of a theory of what pardon ought to do. Um, I, I am not sure what's going to happen um, in this country. I'm not sure what's going to happen in the federal system. I am hoping that, that if there is a second term for this president that he will manage to um, decide that this is one thing that he ought to revisit and do more. There certainly is a great need. The crack cases uh, are a case in point. Um, and the last thing I will say, I just want to respond very quickly to uh, what Chief Judge Jake has said about uh, the role of judges, um, because uh, judges have, interestingly enough, begun to make recommendations even from the bench. They've always had a role in pardon cases, always. And in the very beginning of the Republic, judges would often bring cases to the president. Um, and they've always uh, had a role in the Justice Department system for administering the power. Their recommendation, the sentencing judge's recommendation is always sought if a case is gonna go favorable. Um, but now the, the interesting thing that's beginning to happen is when judges have to impose a sentence that they feel uh, is unjustly severe, they will very frequently make a clemency recommendation right from the bench. Um, so I think that's very interesting. I think things are beginning to happen in the system. Uh, there's beginning to be a new appreciation and an interest. States are beginning to come alive with their exercise of the pardon power. Um, and so I am uh, uh, maybe uh, unduly optimistic, but I am optimistic that things will improve. Um, and I hope that, uh, uh, you know, I think with more public interest and more public demand, um, we will get more 
uh, executive responsibility in, in this area. Hi, my name is Anthony Papa. Before I hit the lottery in 1997, uh, I was serving a 15-year-to-life uh, sentence under the Rockefeller drug laws of New York State. In 1985, I made the biggest mistake in, li in my life. I got involved with drug activity. I brought an envelope up from the Bronx, New York, to Mount Vernon uh, for the sum of $500 from a bowling buddy who convinced me to bring it. Uh, my car kept breaking down, uh, and he said, why are you coming late to the league? And he says, uh, my car break was breaking down. He said, why don't you fix it? I have no money. So he introduced me to somebody, and he offered me $500 to bring this envelope up. At first, I didn't do it, but like a carrot dangling on the string, eventually he came back again. I was desperate, and when you're desperate, you do stupid things. And I did a very stupid thing. I brought the envelope up. I walked into a police thing operation. 20 undercover cops came out of nowhere. They placed me under arrest. I did everything I could do wrong, and I wound up getting sentenced to uh, 15 years to life. Uh, I was sent to Sing Sing Prison, a maximum security prison in Oxygen, in New York. Um, my life was, was over. For me, it was a living nightmare. I really didn't know what to do. Um, I exhausted my state, my federal remedies. I, I had no... Uh, 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 way of getting out until uh, uh, what had happened is I applied uh, for executive clemency and I was lucky enough to be granted clemency by Governor George Pataki in 1997 after 12 years in prison. Uh, without this vehicle of clemency, I would have done the 15 years uh, in prison. Uh, even though I served a lengthy sentence, it was because of the war on drugs in the United States. Uh, especially the Rockefeller drug laws. Uh, in 1973, these laws were enacted uh, because uh, to, uh, by Governor Rockefeller to curb the drug epidemic, uh, uh, but it wasn't like that. Uh, basically, people who were in prison, not a lot of nonviolent offenders like myself. It, it was a disaster. So it, while in prison, uh, I was lucky enough, I discovered my talent as an artist in 1988. Uh, after three years, I picked up a mirror, I looked in the mirror, I saw an individual who was going to spend the most productive years of his life in a cage, and I painted this self-portrait. Seven years later, I wound up at the Whitney Museum of American Art while I was in prison. I got a lot of exposure on my case, and that's how, uh, basically, uh, the governor found out about my story. And it took uh, uh, 12 years, but I made it. So I think executive clemency is a very important vehicle for those who have fallen through the cracks of the criminal justice system because of uh, unjust uh, draconian drug laws uh, that exist in the United States. And I want to thank everybody uh, for coming here tonight and listening to, to uh, what we have to say. Thank you. Well, like Anthony, I'm here because of mandatory sentences as well. Uh, as Bob said, I um, became familiar with sentencing laws after my brother was arrested for growing marijuana in 1990 and sentenced to five years in federal prison without parole in 1991. Um, he didn't have a long enough sentence to get me interested in getting a pardon or commutation for him because it takes five years just to get to the process. But um, his sentence led me to start an organization to try to draw attention to the problems of mandatory sentencing laws and to try to change them. And in the course of the past 20 years, this is our 20th anniversary, I have met thousands of people, certainly heard from thousands of people serving incredibly long sentences like the one Tony describes. And many of them are low-level drug offenders. When mandatory sentences were passed in the 1980s, 1986, federally, there were 24,000 people in prison. Today, there are over 200,000 people in federal prison. The bulk of them are nonviolent drug offenders. So we have, as a matter of sort of seeing so many cases come across our office, become, you know, not only trying to change the laws to try to prevent this from happening to other people, but we've also recognized that these ridiculously long sentences some of these people are serving 
should try to be, um, someone should try to petition for commutation for these people. So certainly around the Clinton, end of Clinton, uh, the Clinton uh, administration, we thought we had an opportunity and we got very involved and provided uh, President Clinton with about 24 cases that he should, should consider for um, commutation. The you know sort of sad thing I was talking to the judge earlier before the session is Clinton is remembered for the Mark Rich commutation and how that destroyed the use of the uh, clemency power to this day. But there were a good number, 21, roughly 21, 22 nonviolent drug offenders granted commutation at the same time that Clinton granted Mark Rich commutation. No one ever heard about them. They were never a problem. Those people have gone on to do a lot of good. And in fact, in the table in the front, there's a flyer that has some of their stories in them. And it's just the, um, it reinforces to me when I, when I talk to these people today that they did not need, one, one woman had 85, an 85 year sentence. She was 20 when she got her sentence. She's now living in Texas and you know, runs some little company. But I mean, she did not need her whole sentence. She's a perfect example of somebody who was uh, deserving of clemency and would never have gotten it if not for our intervention. And that's the really sad part that as Margie Love well knows, because she was a pardon attorney, it's very hard to get the pardon attorney's attention because it's such a process. She sort of, you know, described it, but the pardon attorney is the first one who looks at your petition. And I think when Margaret was there, and I give her credit, she did a very thorough job of looking at each, at each petition. She could spend hours with you tonight telling you at how what a bad job they do today at looking at the petitions. But even if you make it through the pardon attorney's office with a recommendation for um, clemency, it then goes to the attorney general's office, the deputy attorney general's office. It can sit there for, I think the average is nine months right now. And then it may get to the White House. So we all lament that President Obama is not granting more commutations but, or, or pardons, but in fact, it's not just his fault. He does, if he made it a priority, he could ask the Department of Justice and the Pardon Attorney's Office to, to put more emphasis on it. But it's, um, it's a system that is very broken down at the federal system, and I, at the federal level. And I do think the states have got a hand, uh, pretty much of a hand up on the federal system. I'm, I'm very discouraged with the way it is today, and I would like to have your um, sense of hope, Margie. I'm not sure that I do. But something needs to be done, and we are trying to do it. I welcome your questions. Well, Dave Van Zandt, you, you made me promise I wouldn't ask any questions, and I'm going to demonstrate my capability of breaking promises. Uh, <laughs> because it, I think it is, is significant. The blanket uh, uh, clemencies that were granted uh, by Governor Ryan, I mean, before him it was Celeste of Ohio and Tony Anaya of New Mexico, and I think Winthrop Rockefeller uh, before him. And in, in recently, a Supreme Court judge uh, decision uh, has uh, made it necessary for California to vacate uh, uh, a significant number, I can't remember, it was 12, 14,000 prisoners. That, uh, and uh, uh, on behalf of the Citizens Clemency Commission, I put in a call to the governor's office, and it was the blanket amnesties that had previously been done that he remembers as something he doesn't want to do. So he's driven it down to the county uh, jails. I, I have no idea how that's going to possibly work, but we talk, you, you were, you, I mean, Northwestern is extremely famous uh, for being involved uh, in uh, wrongful conviction issues. Uh, just talk to us a little bit about uh, your, your own uh, sense of the importance of these efforts. <clears throat> well, I think, I, uh, obviously, I, I think they're very important, and so did Governor Ryan. Uh, and Governor Ryan was a very interesting case, um, a complicated man um, who who, you know, really, uh, but had sort of a, a very much of a, a people's view of what was happening. He'd come up through the system being uh, uh, in favor of the death penalty, voting for it every time. But when he finally began to hear about some of the cases and some of the way the prosecutions had occurred, um, <clears throat> you know, he, for some reason, he, he changed his mind about it. And, you know, at the time, you would have thought it was uh, politically uh, you know, a political suicide to do something like that uh, for, for a Republican in that state. And, uh, you know, he had other issues at the end of his own gubernatorial campaign. But I don't, you know, I mean, there were some people who were upset from the, the um, mass commutation, but I don't remember a, a giant um, 
you know, it wasn't like uh, impeachment proceedings were being brought against him at the time, which, which I think people at the time thought, thought would happen. <laughs> but I think the real move, um, and, and this is not available in all clemency cases, but I think the real move at Northwestern was to, uh, in, in terms of death penalty cases, was to go away from a moral question about whether or not the death penalty is just or whether, you know, you know in and of itself, the question, what, what Northwestern and some other people, um, and particularly when DNA testing came along, uh, what, what Northwestern was able to do is, is focus on the fact that there was a portion of people on death row, and in Illinois it was over 10 percent, um, who were proven factually um, to be innocent. We're not talking about, you know, technicalities. We're not talking about, you know, and, and I think that was a very important move in terms of making both Governor Ryan willing to do it, which wasn't his normal um, predilection, but also in terms of swaying public opinion in that direction. You, you know, at the same time, you, you saw a moratorium in New Jersey on the death penalty. Um, other states were considering things. And um, you know, I think that was the real important thing that happened, that happened in Northwestern, was the focus on, on factual innocence. Um, now, it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, the people who, who you know, either admit they were guilty or there's a question about it, it doesn't do, do much for them, but it does, I think, put a light on, the, on the, uh, some of the fallacies, you know, some of the problems we have in the criminal justice system. I always wonder that, you know, putting aside death penalty cases, if, if it's 10% of the people on death row um, are factually innocent, just to, you know, take a, take a number. Uh, you know, how many people are in prison for lesser crimes who are factually innocent? Uh, that's a real, I think that's a, that's a startling or a, uh, you know, serious kind of question. You know, Margaret, uh, uh, talk to me a bit about the, the law, because it's true that the, the, in uh, Article 2, as, as Judge Jacobs described, and uh, the more I, by the way, I, I hear of things that Alexander Hamilton wrote and spoke, the more I admire and uh, find myself orienting politically as much to Hamilton as I used to uh, orient to Jefferson. Uh, but uh, uh, a statute has to be written to uh, uh, put in place the process. So there is a, 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 a statute that creates the, the, the federal pardoning efforts. Uh, do you have any ideas yourself of ways you think that law could be modified? Because I, I must say, I, I, I to, 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 to hope that the attitude of the uh, president of the United States, this president or any president, is going to change, I think is to, is to load hope with too much uh, responsibility. I think it's much more likely that changing the law um, uh, is going to get the job done. Well, there there really is no way, uh, particularly in the federal system, it's a constitutional power. And um, a part of the deal um, is that it cannot be limited by law. Um, so, and it never has been limited but by let me, law. Let me, if I can interrupt, I mean, I'm not talking about change, or limiting the power. I'm saying, but for, let me give you an example. You know, what if the law said that the board, you got a pardon board and the deliberations have to be in public? And there's a limited amount of time in which you could, you could set the process. You, you could give it more money so that it could get its job done. You could expedite the process and still not, in, still not interfere with the absolute right of the, power of the president to make the decision. But it seems to me that opening the process up by itself would give the public a better understanding of the, of the low level of risk that they've got when these pardons would be granted. I think it's a wonderful idea. I mean, if Congress appropriated money um, for uh, a more uh, transparent and accountable system for administering the president's part, pardon power, it would be kind of, I think he'd be kind of hard put to, to say, well, I'm really not interested in transparency or accountability. Um, so, um, so I think it's a great idea, but um, it, in the end, um, at least in the federal system, this is not true for all of the states, um, uh, the the uh, uh, system that has existed in the Justice Department, if the president could beef it up, if it could be given a little more stature in the department, if it could be given more money, if it could be taken more seriously. Actually, I heard uh, the first um, White House counsel um, to President Obama, Greg Craig, actually um, made some effort in the brief period of time that he 
uh, was in the White House, to create a commission. He was thinking of retired judges um, who might be a kind of a high level uh, uh, group of respectable uh, folks to give the president um, uh, of, um, uh, a degree of um, protection, a kind of a heat shield. Um, this, this actually happens in several states. There are high level boards of and sometimes elected, sometimes appointed commissions. Um, both that, that is the Georgia system. No, it's not. Now, the Georgia system actually is kind of interesting. The Georgia, they are ap appointed. Uh, and I like Georgia. I'm a big fan of the Georgia the board. Georgia system. Um, South Carolina also. One of the problems with the Georgia and South Carolina boards, um, Alabama has one like this too, actually, is, uh, and Connecticut. Um, they, they tend to be a little bit um, bureaucratic. So in a sense, a grant from the Georgia board is not as uh, respectable and prestigious as a grant from the Nebraska board. Um, an employer is not as impressed uh, by a grant of pardon from the Georgia board, um, I believe, as it is, because there are, it's just a, a kind of a delicate balancing of all the different factors. Um, and, uh, you know, I would rather have uh, more pardons than fewer pardons, but I think if I were constructing an ideal system, um, I would try to have one that, that had a little bit more, um, frankly, prestige to it. Um, so I think the idea of a board uh, to advise the president, uh, perhaps give statutory pardons. Now, that's another idea, that if even if the president's power cannot be limited, there's absolutely no reason why Congress could not create a parallel process, as it has for the military, for example, um, giving pardons, um, certificates of good conduct, very much like you have in New York here, which is, uh, could be a really excellent system if it worked a little better. Um, I don't mean to uh, make light of it. Um, the, the person who asked this has a very strong feeling, um, justifiably in my opinion, about a number uh, of commutations that were done by President Clinton in 1999, the um, so-called FALN, uh, Puerto Rican terrorist uh, commutations. You all in New York had experience with uh, these folks. They blew up Francis Tavern. Um, they were called the Macheteros. Uh, they, were, they were in Illinois. And they were, frankly, a pretty scary bunch. Uh, and they had been in prison for 22 years. And President Clinton wanted very much to commute their sentences. Um, we got uh, a huge campaign. Um, uh, of people supporting these. Um, I recommended against clemency for them because they had done very serious things. Um, and uh, that, that was on the recommendation of the various folks, including the U.S. attorneys in the various districts um, that made these recommendations. Um, in the end, uh, shortly, uh, I did leave the department. Um, uh, and it seemed to be shortly after that recommendation, although, uh, and, and in the end, uh, the attorney general, the new attorney general, um, uh, new deputy attorney general, I should say, um, recommended in favor of these clemencies. Now, we didn't know that at the time, but we did know it when he was confirmed to be attorney general this time. Um, so, um, in any event, I don't know to what extent my role had anything to do with my leaving the department. I would have thought, if you had asked me at the time, that I was rather my enthusiasm for recommending too many cases um, rather than recommending against these cases. But um, in, in any event, there were many people, and I do want to take this very seriously because uh, the person who asked this question has, is very close to uh, someone who was uh, the victim of these folks, and um, so I know that he felt very, very strongly about it, and, and I think it was unfortunate. I think the Department of Justice did not cover itself with glory um, in serving, and did not serve the president well in those cases. Um, that, is, that was the beginning of, of a bad run, frankly, to the end of the Clinton administration, where I don't believe the Department of Justice served the president very well. You, you um, didn't name him, but the deputy at the time was Eric Holder, who was the current AG. That's correct. 
Bob, do, do you, you were leaning forward, cl getting close to the mic. I don't know if it was for warmth or <laughs> you. Wanna... Everybody to kind of huddle. <laughs> we're we're going to huddle. There's a number. There's a we're number not going to no huddle here. We're going to huddle because it's freezing. Bob, there's freezing. a number. There's a number of questions in here having to do with the cost of incarceration. Yeah. Uh, is that is, was that a part of your own consideration, or is it a part of your thinking more broadly about? It, it's a uh, fact. Justice? It's a fact of the process, but it was not a driving motivator uh, with regard to, to my approach. Uh, there's so much to say here. It's, we could go on for, for a long time. It's just that the reality of it is uh, we're human, and humans make fallible systems, and the system is fallible. Secondly, with regard to what you always have as governor, limited resources, regardless of how much revenue you have, there's always needs. Same debate we're having in the country today. If there are people at twenty-five, thirty-five thousand dollars a year taking up space that shouldn't be there, it's not a very positive policy result for the state or nor for that person. Not complicated. Julie, has, has FAM done any examination of, of cost of federal incarceration? Have you done? Uh, the average is about 28000 a year per inmate. And, and as I recall, either you or Molly, when I was down there last, you had some uh, actual numbers of the number of cases that were uh, denied in this, uh, in this past year, and how many of those were for immigration cases, and how many of those are drug cases. Uh, yeah. How many of those are nonviolent? I'm just trying to get some color yeah. on, the, on, the, on, on, um, on what we're talking about at the federal level. Unfortunately, it was Molly that gave you those stats, not me. But I bet that Marky knows them. Do you know? Um, are you talking about the, the number of people who were denied clemency? Yes. Or, um, I believe President Obama has denied about um, 4,000 um, ap applications to date. Uh, most of those are prisoner petitions, not all, about 3,000 are. Um, I don't know what the breakdown is. They don't publicize what the breakdown is. If, if they are reflective of the federal prison system, then probably half are drug cases. Um, there are a lot of immigration cases. I wouldn't say they're probably uh, the, uh, o overly represented in the commutation um, cases, but certainly in the pardon cases, um, for a lawful permanent resident who committed the smallest crime, misdemeanor, um, many years ago sometimes, they are deportable. And you all probably uh, were made aware of this through Governor Patterson's very commendable effort uh, to address some of these cases where people had lived here all of their lives, practically been brought here as babies, and then somehow got in trouble as a teenager or something, and then they were going to be deported and separated from their families. And there are, believe me, a lot of cases, federal cases now, um, a couple of my clients, as a matter of fact, who are seeking pardon to avoid deportation, uh, legal, uh, long-time people, long-time members of the community, in a couple of cases, very productive. Um, he has not done any of those. I don't know how many were among the denials. Um, let, me, let, me, let me press you on this a bit. I mean, let's, let's sort of, if you don't mind for the moment, let's presume that you're president of the United States, right? And you're, you're, you're still on this panel and we're all surrounded by Secret Service or something like that. So uh, you're president of the United States and what, what's your estimate of the number of pardons that you think you would grant? Of that 4,000, I mean, what, what, what are we talking about in scale, in, in your estimation, that are deserving of pardons but don't get it? Well, one of the interesting things about the pardon power is that it is kind of like a canary in the coal mine. It, it is kind of a, um, an indicator of the health of the justice system. I'm going to answer your question, but I'm just going to say this first. There are a lot of people people who have long since served their prison sentences, as well as people who are in prison, uh, who need clemency. I think if I were president, I would want to um, start working in two directions. Number one, to try to understand who was applying for clemency and trying to understand the caseload and trying to understand what the problems were that they were bringing to my attention. I would also start to construct alternative ways 
to deal with these situations, not so that I had to be, for example, a one-man gun licensing bureau, which is what President Obama is. You cannot get a hunting license in this country ever, ever again if you have a federal conviction, uh, no matter what you did. Even if you cheated on your income tax in 1972, you cannot get a hunting license. President Obama is the only source of a hunting license. <laughs> Which, in, well, I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. And that's, you know, that's a very s serious thing. It may not be serious in New York. I know your mayor feels extremely strongly about this. And I saw in the paper today that there was, well, never mind, an unfortunate incident with importation of s said guns into the city. But in some states, in the West in particular, where people hunt for their food, it's a very serious thing. So. To get back to that, I, I would want to uh, start pardoning early and often, but I would also start constructing a way to deal with the collateral consequences of conviction, as well as the people who are in prison who do not need to be there anymore. And I'd just add to that, oh, I'm sorry, no. that um, one category, for instance, would be to look at everyone who's serving life without parole in federal prison. Many of them have been there a very long time. It's not a huge number, but why not look at each of those cases? If, if I can bring this back to politics for a second, we were sure. talking about the law and constitutional protections and due process. The bottom line, this is an inherently political process. This is politics. You know, the Willie Horton ads were all about politics, Mark Rich politics. Uh, there's so much disincentive to act. Uh, my, Greg was telling you, my press secretary is here, and he used to sit there not happily uh, during our, our meetings. And he reminded me today of one of the reasons he, he was not happy. In Maryland, statutorily, we'd have to advertise what was coming. A couple weeks, right? A couple weeks prior to granting uh, pardons. The Baltimore Sun, who loved me, uh, would assign reporters to go out and talk to victims. That's fun. <laughs> it makes the press secretary's life fun, it makes the governor's fun, anybody facing re-election. The bottom line is, just statutorily, with regard in our little state, Maryland, it, there's a, a disincentive not to act, let alone waking up in the middle of the night thinking, geez, what did I do about that, uh, that three-time loser statute, daytime housebreaking, all right, well, when's that person going to turn violent? When's that mom going to get killed? When, when is that one case going to turn bad? So besides the, the real our most tangible potential negative repercussions. There's also systemic problems in, in our state with regard to doing the right thing. Let me ask if the, any of the panelists, and yourself included, Judge. I mean, it, it appears, uh, and, and perhaps the presumption is incorrect. If it's incorrect, uh, please uh, disabuse me of the conclusion that uh, uh, you're better off in the state system if you're on a drug crime than you are in the federal system and that, it, that somebody makes a decision about, about whether or not you're going to go into the state or into the federal system. Yes. And the question is whether or not class and race figure into that decision making more than they ought to. Well, <laughs> um, it is a very arbitrary decision as to which system. I'm, I'm speaking primarily right now of drug defendants. I mean, my brother was growing marijuana in a garage. Why was that a federal offense? So he was sentenced federally, as many of these nonviolent low-level drug defendants are, when the states could easily have handled their sentence. Um, the suspicion is that because he was going to get more time in the federal system than he would have in Washington State's prison system. Um, but then there are states like New York, where Anthony Papa spent time, or in Michigan, where you used to get life without parole for a pound and a quarter of, of uh, heroin or cocaine. Um, that had really extreme sentences. But I think there's a lot of jurisdiction shopping among prosecutors when they decide where to prosecute a defendant. But do you think, uh, uh, stick with race, do you think race has a disproportionate impact on sentencing? Well, that's a loaded question. Um, no, I don't think it's... Uh, I, I uh, well, again, I mean, certainly with crack, the prosecution knew they would get a lot longer sentence in the federal system than in the state. Now, Crack isn't always used by African Americans, but that was the target audience for many crack prosecutions. Well, it certainly appears the stop and frisk program in New York City has a disproportionate impact on black and Latino uh, 
people. Yes. Yeah, that was just a big issue that recently occurred uh, where um, we challenged uh, Mayor Bloomberg and the commissioner of marijuana arrest, 50000 a year, costing uh, the city of New York $75 million uh, to arrest nonviolent uh, pot smokers, uh, making it a crime uh, where it wasn't a crime in re regards to the law, which had been on the books since 1978, was possessing small amounts of marijuana, and because of police policies in New York City, uh, they would stop and frisk and basically tell the person they stopped, which were mainly black and Latinos, that if you, uh, you know, if you got anything in your pocket, take it out and we'll take it easy. And then as soon as they expose it in the open, it became uh, eligible to be, you know, arrested. And instead of giving him uh, like a fine and a ticket, they would arrest them and then they would get an arrest record and could, could ruin their lives forever uh, doing that. Uh, Margaret, there's a, a number of questions here from individuals who are just simply asking, how do you initiate a request for a, for a pardon? I'm going to presume it's federal, so you can... Oh, sure. Um, well, you simply file a fairly simple application. Is it, that's the short answer. Uh, there's a little bit longer... Act, uh, I mean, it, there are certain ways to file a more effective application than others. It's, it's my business, I guess. Anybody want to apply for a pardon? Be happy to speak to you afterwards. Um, I hope there's nobody here looking to apply for a commutation. Uh, but but uh, in any event, uh, no, it's a fairly simple process. It's an application that's filed through the Justice Department. And uh, theoretically, each application is investigated and, and a report is written and it is sent from the pardon attorney through the deputy attorney general to the White House. It's a very simple system. Um, the problem is, I think, that there is such a large demand um, <clears throat> for this relief that uh, there are very, very uh, high standards. Uh, in fact, um, uh, so high that, um, uh, well, they're very high, but they're also a bit capricious, uh, and it's a bit, it is a bit like a lottery, frankly. Um, and if you look at the people that President Obama has pardoned, the 17 people that he's pardoned, I mean, how could you tell them from most other people who happen to have made a mistake in their life at some point? They're very ordinary people. Uh, I love the story of the guy who, um, uh, um, mutilated coins. That's a great one. 1963, he was in the Marine Corps and they were filing the edges off pennies so they could put them in the vending machine. Uh, he didn't even know he had a felony conviction until he went in 2005 to buy a gun to hunt. So, you know, 40 years later, uh, he applied for a pardon and I I, he had a real reason for wanting a pardon because he would like to go hunting. Um, he'd been hunting all these years, but uh, I guess that was the <laughs> <laughs> nobody was going to raise that one. Um, Must have been probably in Nebraska where we underfund the game warden program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, <laughs> you know, let me just say that that there are a lot of states now under economic pressure um, that have been rolling back the drug laws and other really tough laws and trying to figure out how to deal with people in, in a both a humane and sensible way rather than sending them to prison because while there are some people who manifestly belong in prison, there are an awful lot of people that do not. And so there are a lot of very helpful things. I was just reading um, yesterday a very comprehensive uh, reform agenda that's just been enacted in Ohio who has a Republican governor, and it's a very soup to nuts kind of a reform agenda. Um, I would love it if the federal government felt the same fiscal uh, pressure <laughs> that the states do. Um, but, you know, it's um, kind of hard when you're running uh, several wars around the world to uh, feel uh, that the budget of the federal prison system is um, you know, 
very important. Um, so it is something that is happening in the States and all I can think of is that ultimately, hopefully, it will you know, trickle up to the federal system. Well, I, I think the, the chances of that happening are almost zero. Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't think things trickle up to the federal system. I think you, 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 you decide how you want the law to change and you're an advocate for changing the law. And among the great sadnesses in this area is the fact that uh, Jim Webb yeah. uh, is leaving the Senate at the end of his first term. And, you know, Jim told me he hired two convicted felons in his office. He said, how else can you figure out how the, the justice system is working unless you've got some people that's actually experienced it? Well, I'm, not, I'm, I'm willing to actually assert that he's only one of 535 people who had that idea. Uh, I mean, what are the chances, uh, uh, Julie, being your, I, I know you've been very much involved with some of these federal efforts. What are the chances that federal law can, can be changed to make people looking at our system say it's, it's more just than it was before and more equitable than it was before and that we've, you know, that we've balanced uh, uh, cost against, it seems, a reasonable effort to try to keep the country safe? Well, I think two things. One, um, Jim Webb is leaving, and that's... Uh, sat on a number of levels, but it's also interesting that the Webb Commission, which he's been trying to get going, which is basically a, a top-to-bottom review of criminal justice across the country, his bill, just to get a commission to review criminal justice, is having an incredibly hard time getting out of the Senate and probably won't get out of the House. And so even just asking to take a look at the problem isn't getting anywhere, which is incredibly discouraging to think about you know, trying to create a commission to look at clemency, for instance, in the federal system. Um, yes, there have been changes and improvements in the 20 years I've been doing this, or I would have shot myself by now. Um, so, you know, the federal system has gotten better, but, um, and so have states, but it is a slow, slow process. And I have to say, and, and this speaks to you, Governor Ehrlich, that most the progress we've seen in states and actually federally has been led by Republicans. And I think it's a Nixon goes to China kind of phenomena, that it's your credentials as being tough on crime are secure. You don't have to you know, worry about somebody accusing you of that. And so you can go forward and actually do something brave and bold and sure. step up. And I mean, that's a sad statement. And I try to stay out of the political you know, taking sides here. As a libertarian, I don't have to. Um, but it's, uh, <laughs> it is very discouraging that you know, there aren't more uh, bold, Republicans and Democrats and libertarian leaders um, saying something's broken and we need to fix it. Well, I mean, you know, I've, 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 I've been a part of many political efforts and when, and when you're trying to get something done, there's usually an appeal to an audience to get behind uh, S whatever it is that the web commission, so what, what, does that piece of legislation have a number? Can you, can you inform <laughs> the audience that they, I mean, it's, I, I, I I must say, I, 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 I confess that I'm, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I can't help myself. I've, I've, I've watched most of the Republican presidential debates, and uh, to the best of my recollection, that question has never been asked. Uh, so, I, and I agree with you. I think first it is. First of all, I'm worried about you. First of all, well, <laughs> your your worry is well placed. I, I, I haven't watched it. <laughs> but I think the point is counterintuitive is dangerous in many respects. Your Nixon goes to China. I've used that a lot. I think counterintuitive in politics can get things done. In many, you know that. In, oh, I agree. In, I, so. I completely agree. But the question, if if that's if that, again, if we presume that that's the case, uh, 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 wouldn't it be a good thing for us to try to uh, influence the moderators of these debates to get that question as to whether or not they support the Web Commission? <laughs> well, Sir? it's a simple Sir? question here. I'm, you know yeah. it's not going to happen because well, it's not sexy enough. We can make it sexy. Well, it's we true. Yeah, it I guess we could. <laughs> we can put lipstick on this pig yeah. and make it look nice. We well, I have to say that, and I said this to Governor Ehrlich earlier, um, which, which he actually didn't know, but I remember Governor Romney in the campaign last time uh, made a point of, it was a point of pride with him as to saying when he was governor of Massachusetts, he had never issued a single pardon. I mean, he said that, you know, quite publicly and several times. So um, I don't think it's entirely a partisan thing, frankly. Um, and I think you should take more credit because I think it is a personality thing. And I have seen it. Yeah. I mean, I, I've seen 
good Democrats. Ted Strickland was wonderful um, in Ohio. David Patterson was courageous in that immigration commission. Um, so I don't think it's entirely, you know, I think it's uh, uh, Governor Quinn in Illinois is doing Ted very Strickland, well. by the way, took a guy out of death row about two weeks out from his, his election that he lost. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. He reduced his yeah. sentence to oh, life. That's right. That's right. right. Yeah, well, he did do a number of capital right. cases, and he did lose. That's absolutely right. Um, but, um, but he did a good job. He really did. And um, so I don't know. One thing that, that could happen would be to get together um, a number of people who are opinion makers, I guess, uh, or opinion influencers, uh, who are interested in this problem and to begin to talk about it. If the administration won't establish a commission, maybe, you know, uh, some independent group ought to establish a commission. I think Bob's done that. Well, What's that? I think you've done that. Well, I know, but if we don't have the we don't have the force of law. I mean, it's it's well, nice to have subpoena powers, and we we, you know, Bob and I and and, and Tom and Gaston, all we got is all we have is each other. <laughs> you can sit around a room and pretend, I guess. <laughs> Call each other former. Wow. <laughs> But you do have the stature, actually, to um, produce a report of some kind that would be, you know, picked up by the media. That you would obviously have a press conference and you would announce that, you know, something needs to be done. And you know, here's a group. You might want to add a couple more governors, former governors, to your cadre. I mean, but, I've, I've, and, by the um, way, I've had, I've had conversations with governors who have expressed a similar sort of pride that, that, that Mitt Romney has. So it's a, it's quite shocking when you hear the words. I'm proud yeah. that I never pardoned yeah. anybody. Well, you'll be adding President Obama to that soon. If you, he hasn't issued one commutation yet, so no one has gotten out of prison during the time that President Obama has been in office. No humans. He commuted a couple of turkeys, so didn't he? Yeah, <laughs> turkeys, not people. I mean, but I think you do have a, the seeds here of a very uh, effective voice for this issue that would be heard in Congress. I also think we should divide the question, particularly for the young people here. Uh, pardoning somebody at 48 years old for a fist fight when he was 17 is easy. It's, there's no just. He's looking, looking at three time loser cases, looking at uh, uh, these uh, guys that have been there for 20, 30, 35 years, and you're looking at life sentences, and you're going to decide on the basis of race, assistance of counsel, something doesn't smell right, something doesn't. You talk to the judge, the co defendants are out. All these facts that, that have become germane in, in various cases, uh, that's the one, that's the case that the press are going to pick up on. That's, the, that's where the, uh, if the victim is not acquiescent, you're going to have the press conference. That's where the political fortitude uh, or lack thereof comes into play. But you could start with the easy cases. Oh, yeah. And, and, and there's no skin in those. I mean, but. I, I just don't understand that mindset, but I'll talk to Mitt. That's my promise. Yes. Well, I want to thank the panelists uh, very much, both uh, for their past efforts, their current efforts, and hopefully we can make some change happen. <laughs> <laughs>